All right, now I'm going to ask Jamie to get back up here. We got some unfinished business to take care of. Um, also, I have to apologize. This is going to be really awkward. I was supposed to get wired for a mic so I could sit next to him, but um, I don't know if that's going to work. So I may have to, he, he's already wired, but I may have to use the, oh, wait. Sure. Here's the guy. He's going to rescue me. <coughs> Sorry about that. All right, you can go ahead and sit. All right, good. I'll, I'll be ready here. Um, let's see, make sure I. <coughs> all right, I think we're good. All right, you owe some explanations. All right, good. <laughs> Bring it on. All right. I've got about, it's not on? There we go. All right. <coughs> all right, let me. That actually, it, it's funny. When I was in Geneva for the first meeting of our World Health Organization Committee on Gene Editing. So we were there for this international meeting talking about the recasting of all of life on Earth. And the very first experience was a PowerPoint presentation. And it, it didn't work. And then they called IT and they were like fiddling with that. They were trying to do the screen. And I leaned over to the person next to me and I said, like, I, we're in this meeting talking about recasting life on Earth and we can't make the PowerPoint work. <laughs> how, how is this going to happen? Yeah, no, it's all about AT. That, that's yeah. really kind of scary. <laughs> all right, so first of all, I want to say welcome home. Thank you. Welcome back to Thank Twin you. Cities. And uh, before we dive into this, I, I want to know a little bit more about how you made it from Barstow mm. to, to where you are today. So tell us a little bit about the, the, the history. What, what, sure. what path did you take to get there? I can tell this is going to be a hard-hitting interview, <laughs> so I'm, my, my defenses oh, are, they get, my, they get my defenses are, are, are up. Um, so I'll just, just a, a quick thing. So growing up in Kansas City, and I talked about my own history, uh, values and ethics were always just a really important part of who I was and, and what I, my family stood for and, and what I stood for. When I was a freshman at Brown, I met a classmate of mine who was a survivor of the Cambodian genocide. And his whole family had been killed. He'd actually had been adopt adopted by an American aid worker in a refugee camp. And that had just a deep and profound impact on me. And so that summer, I was 18. Um, I quit my job at a summer camp in Kansas City on the first day. I had a garage sale of all the junk in my parents' house, although there's still a lot left, if anyone wants anything. <laughs> um, and, um, and bought a ticket and went to Thailand and went to a refugee camp and volunteered. And um, had this just incredible life-changing experience. And that led me um, to recognize, though, that you could spend your entire life in refugee camps and not change the superstructure that causes refugees to be created. And so that made me feel that I needed to kind of move up in the, <coughs> in the food chain to where, to the area where problems, <coughs> excuse me, problems were being created um, or, or fixed. And that led me into serving in the United States government. And so after law school, I was on the US National Security Council and my then boss, Richard Clark, was the guy who had essentially predicted 9-11. And he had written the memo that was on George Bush's desk when 9-11 happened saying we, there's terrorism as a threat, we need to focus on Al-Qaeda and here's what we, what we need to do. And Dick always used to say that if everyone in Washington was focusing on one thing, you could be sure there was something much more important that, that was being missed. And so for him, it was terrorism and cyber. For me, more than 20 years ago, it was genetics and biotech, which I recognized then as, as um, these uh, revolutionary technologies that were going to transform a lot of, of life. And I just threw myself then into educating myself. You know, I'm, I'm self-taught in the sciences. Um, then I started writing articles. Uh, then uh, a member of Congress, Brad Sherman, called me and said, I read one of your articles. It's really important. I wanted to organize a congressional hearing around it. Will you be the lead witness and tell me who else I should have? So I did that and just got more and more involved. Um, and then I was, um, and my first book had been a history of the Cambodian genocide, and my second book had been a novel kind of telling that story in a, in a more accessible way. So then I felt like I was trying to tell the story of the genetics revolution through these kind of somewhat dense policy articles, and I wasn't breaking through. So that was why then I wrote my two near-term sci-fi novels, um, Genesis Code and Eternal Sonata, and actually there were are people in this room who were at my book events for those, because they're actually set in Kansas City. 
But when I was on my book tours for those books, and I explained the science to people the way a novelist would explain science, which is often very different from the way a scientist would explain science, all of a sudden I saw that look in people's eyes that frankly I saw in all of yours when I was speaking a moment ago where people's like, wow, that's what's happening? Like I'd heard the word genetics, I'd heard DNA, I'd heard IVF, but I didn't know that this was the, the story. And that was what made me realize I needed to write this book to tell the story of the genetics revolution, why it was so personal, what was at stake, and what everybody um, could do, but in a way that, that people could absorb. That's it. <laughs> Quite a journey. Yeah, and it's still going. Okay, so you're obviously optimistic. Um, <coughs> yeah. I can guarantee you a lot more optimistic than I am right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the, uh, there's a lot of ethical issues here we gotta yeah. grapple with, yeah. um, some pretty significant ones especially in this country. Um, you had mentioned in some of the sessions that we've had that yeah. it's a little bit easier, you know, probably coming from the United Kingdom in terms of the national policy that's there, and, and then the United States, it's a little more Wild West. Right. So could you talk a little bit about what your, your, uh, your feelings are about that and how in this country, if we are going to have to grapple with yeah. this, what does it look like if we are in Wild West and we I mean, we have a hard time now having civil conversations with each other about just about everything. Right. I can't imagine us coming together and deciding that we're going to go down a path together, uh, at least respectfully, yeah. on this topic. It's really difficult. So when you look around the world, and we can just well, let's pick three countries to use as, as reference points. Um, there's the United Kingdom, which has a really rational national health plan where big decisions are made primarily at a national level. They're often made based on a rational debate and a cost-benefit analysis. And then the result of that analysis and the decisions that are made then filter through that system. So that, in my mind, is really ideal. Then there's the other end of the spectrum, which is China, which is very poorly regulated, very lax oversight, a true Wild West mentality where they have an enormous amount of money, some extremely brilliant scientists, and are engaged in a race to catch up with what they see as being centuries of humiliation at the, at the hands of foreign powers, and they're going to take and are taking a lot of shortcuts to get from here to there. So that's the true Wild West. And in the middle, there's our country, the United States, where we are spending more in absolute and per capita terms on healthcare by far than any other country on earth with far worse outcomes where in some ways we have decent regulations but in some in other ways we just really have this totally divided environment where the average person is changing health plans every 18 months and it makes it very very difficult to have uniform national policies even if we had the kind of rational system like the United Kingdom has because you would say, well, who is making the decision? Is it the federal government? And the FDA is certainly, it's a great agency and it does a, a very good job. Is it these health insurance providers, um, but who have all these different financial in incentives, um, or is it doctors? And so I was meeting this morning, and you were there, John, with the students at uh, Kansas City University. I was saying, if you were in the United Kingdom, your job would be a, a lot easier because decisions would be made by the time patients reached you. But there was a doctor who was saying, well, how do we do, how do we as, as doctors do the cost-benefit analysis for patients who come? And when we think, well, we know there's this, this generalized medicine, as I talked about earlier, approach that works pretty well. There's some really expensive precision medicine approach. It may cost $50,000, half a million dollars, a million dollars, and this is really expensive stuff. Some, a lot of it is not covered by insurance. And people are just left to their own devices. And doctors are left to their own devices to try to, to navigate this. And then on top of that, there are these, all of these unresolved ethical questions. And I'll just give one example. And, and this is a question we could kind of go on all night about. Um, but in the United States, there's a, a procedure um, called mitochondrial transfer. And I won't go into the details, but basically, 
uh, mitochondria exist in the cytoplasm of a cell. So if uh, you can think of a cell as an egg, the nucleus is the yolk and the cytoplasm is the white. Uh, mitochondria pass from mother to the children. Uh, and so there's a new procedure, mitochondrial transfer, where you swap out, you can do it at the egg or the embryo level, but you swap out the egg white. So you have the nuclear parent's egg yolk or the mother's, the, let's make it easy, the, the mother's egg yolk in the egg and the donor's egg white, which has this small number of DNA, uh, the small uh, number of, uh, of um, genetic materials, and then those are passed, and that's why they call these quote-unquote three-parent babies. It's banned in the, uh, in, uh, in the United States. Um, it's a form of genetic engineering, non-nuclear genetic engineering. In the United Kingdom, there was a question, should we do this? They had a three-year national debate. It was a big deal national debate. At the end of that, they had a free vote of both houses of parliament. Free vote meaning people weren't bound by their party affiliation. And then they decided to authorize clinical trials in mitochondrial transfer. And then in doing so, they authorized their state regulatory agency, the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, to oversee this process and to authorize these trials on a case-by-case -case basis. And now it's happened, and the first of these mitochondrial transfer babies will be born uh, in Newcastle uh, later this year. But that's something, it's, uh, that's the way a rational health system works. Our system, we have the regulators at the FDA, but we kind of have chaos. And there are a lot of conversations that we can't have because when we talk about these really difficult issues of genetics, abortion very quickly comes into the debate and we can't have a conversation about abortion because everybody goes right to the, to the barricades. And that's, again, coming back to what I was saying in my remarks, that's why the work that, that you at the center are doing, the work that all of you are part of because you're, you're here is so important because if we can't find a way to have inclusive conversations, and by inclusive, I mean conversations with people who we may totally agree with. I, mean, I was speaking this morning at, at KCU and there was a student who was obviously coming from a very, tra <coughs> very traditional background and he said, well, I didn't hear myself in your talk. And I said, well, I'm sorry because I think everybody needs to be at the table. The Catholic Church needs to be part of this conversation. The transhumanists who think we should just genetically engineer our, our children with no limits, they need to be part of the conversation because anybody who's not part of the conversation is outside of the conversation, but the technology is advancing anyway. All right, I've got like six <coughs> questions in three yeah. minutes. So okay, wait, good. Well, we'll there's do no way we're gonna get through that. So round. I'm gonna ask the <coughs> most important one. Yes. First one I wanna, I want to ask is uh, what from one of our staff. Yeah. And it's boxers. It, I'm going to actually read it because it, I can't I can't actually improve on it. So this <coughs> is from a colleague. Your book suggests that the fertility clinic of the future offers significant opportunities for families to choose the future traits of their children. Everything from maximizing health by avoiding serious future illness to choosing physical traits like hair, eye color, to enhancing cognitive and emotional intelligence and athletic ability. It strikes me that this process may fundamentally change the experience of having a baby from one filled with hopes and dreams for the future of that child to deep-seated, scientifically reinforced expectations of the child that you've co carefully selected. As Andy Lamott has written, expectations are resentments under construction. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this shift from the hope to expectation might significantly change or disrupt the critical intimate bond between parent and child? And how might advances in reproductive technology change the way that we understand family commitments yeah. and relationships? Because we're in the speed round, I will answer <laughs> that quickly. Yes, that is a very <laughs> real possibility. We know the process that we are familiar with. And that's why talking about doing things differently is deep, it's frightening, it's uncomfortable, and for some very good reasons. And so I'm not saying that the way that we've made babies for all of these years is inherently wrong. All I'm saying is that this new technology is coming and it's going to have some very, very real benefits. And the primary initial benefit, the kind of entry app, is going to be eliminating or preventing lots of genetic diseases that have plagued our ancestors for as long as we've been around. And these diseases are individually rare but collectively common. 
but that doesn't mean, let's say we can, we can reduce this risk very significantly. We need to be really mindful. I mean, we are messing with the core of what it means to be a human being, and we can't be glib about that. And we need to have a, a conversation because it would be terrible if people started to see their, their children as some kind of consumer product. It's like, you know, I paid extra for enhanced cognitive ability, and when this I guy, I, I thought we were gonna win the spelling bee. This, I want a <laughs> refund. I mean, this, this, is, this is real stuff, and it's serious, and there are real trade-offs. And we won't be able to get everything, but we have to be very conscious of, w of what we're trading, and we may lose a little bit of this sense of the bond, and we may s collectively decide that that loss is so great that we don't want to do this. And I think that's a very legitimate choice, but all choices will have consequences, and they'll have consequences in that we may allow a dangerous risk to continue that we could have eliminated, or very well, we could be doing something that we think is good and create some harm in the future. But we will have to choose, and we, we won't be able to say, like, and, and saying, well, I don't want to change anything, I want to do it the old-fashioned way is a perfectly legit legitimate choice, but we shouldn't deceive ourselves and think of that as not a choice. There are no short answers. Yes, I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> so here's, a, here's one that I think that, that <coughs> particularly uh, troubles me. You, you've mentioned uh, over the last couple of days in your remarks um, that we are massively complex beings, but we're not inf infinitely right. complex beings. Uh, I'd like to suggest that, uh, although I respect your position, uh, I'm not of the same mind. Right. Um, I truly believe we are infinitely complex beings. I think some of that comes from my faith tradition, yeah. which I realize is something that I've accepted yeah. and, and received as a gift in my, my view. Yeah. Um, but this, and, and I'm not arguing that we aren't on an evolutionary journey, right. but I think that evolutionary journey is a sacred obligation and not necessarily just a, a secular one. So do you think it's possible uh, for you and me to walk down this same road? Yes. And come to some common understanding about the good and the bad and the ugly? I think so, but I think that we need to be very mindful. We have so many topics that are less sensitive than this, where people have gone to the barricades and haven't found a way to work together, to respect each other, uh, to try to find some common ground uh, that allows people to live lives that respect their deepest beliefs but accept that others may live their lives differently and make different kinds of, uh, of choices. And even if we won't know whether you're right or I'm right for oh many- I know about I'm right. <laughs> I and, I and frankly, <laughs> I hope you're right. Like if, if it is true that there is some kind of universal design that is created by some kind of positive force we can call God, we're all winners, and if I find out that that's the case, awesome, I will be thrilled. And even if my philosophy, as I've expressed over these last couple of days, that human beings are massively complex, and what I say is that we are single cell organisms gone wild over four billion years of evolution. And so however understandable you think a single cell organism is, that is about how understandable we will eventually be relative to, as I mentioned before, um, to the sophistication of our, uh, of our tools. But we'll never get to 100% understanding, frankly, of anything, but certainly of, of a system as complex as our own biology. But way before then, we're going to have to make some really fundamental decisions about how to behave. And even now, when I talk, uh, the reason why I said when we're doing gene editing of, um, uh, of, um, of em pre-implanted embryos, why I said we'll only do two or three changes. And in my, in my editorial in the New York Times, I talk about that and it's said in the year 2045, I still say two or three changes, um, is because we don't really understand that much of how our, our genome works. And the genome is set within the system of our more complex biology, systems biology, which is set in the complexity of the environment around us. And so the interventions that we'll be able to make most comfortably will be interventions that don't require a complete understanding. And that's why 
embryo selection will happen a lot sooner than any kind of significant genome uh, editing. And that's why even, for example, microbiome, everyone's talking about their microbiome, and we can have our microbiome sequenced, and we can know a lot about our health. But then you say, all right, what do I do? And you can say, well, eat kimchi and sauerkraut and fiber, but I hope nobody here, if you're taking probiotics, you're not doing anything that help, that's helpful. Maybe you're not hurting yourself, I don't know. Uh, but we do know that there are things, and I'm, I don't know if, I guess everyone's already had their dinner, like fecal transplants that actually work for ways that we don't even fully yeah, understand. understand. And so I think that there will be interventions that don't require a complete understanding, but they can be incredibly powerful. And I think that people can come from very, from very different traditions, and as long as your focus is on enhancing the health and well-being of people, then we're on the same journey, and we just need to figure out how to travel that, that journey in a way that can help most of us. Well, and Rich Payne uh, <coughs> did a presentation on this at the BioNexus conference uh, December 17, I think, or something like that. And he talked about human flourishing and yeah, trying to define right. what human flourishing yeah. is. So, so on that path, we're going to try to get everybody back together, as I mentioned, in August after they've read the book yeah. and to begin this conversation. Great. And I want to, as one of the parting uh, shots for tonight as, as you leave and help us start this process of thinking about this, Describe for me what you think an ideal conversation would look like and um, at a community level. So, yeah. so I know <coughs> you're in the geopolitical realm. No, no, it's really important. I'm, I'm somewhat curious as to whether or not you think the geopolitical realm informs the local or does the local inform the other. Yes. I'm, I'm also interested <coughs> at the community level in, in being able to take it home and yeah. say, okay, what does this look like over dinner yeah. to have this conversation? So that, that's yes, I'm so glad that you asked this because if you remember when I started right my remarks, I talked about Kansas City going from this kind of place that people thought, oh, that's where bumpkins on <laughs> mules come from, um, to Kansas City as this cutting edge place where really exciting things are happening that aren't just exciting for Kansas City. It's not just, oh, it's we're better than St. Louis. Um, it's we are a serious place doing great things. So what I would love is for Kansas City to show the country and the world what it means like to have a com real community-wide dialogue around essential questions. So I would say is we, we take these big topics, we identify, let's say, three essential questions, create very readable, understandable background materials on each one and have it at different levels and say what we want is every school in Kansas City to be exploring these questions. Every church, every book club, I mean you can pick a book, any book that I you want to read. three book clubs tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pick any book, book yeah. you, whatever <laughs> that you want to read for your book club. Um, uh, and then for the center, working with other organizations to say we're going to have 50 community forums all around town, and then we're going to get all of this information. We're going to have a standardized format for so everyone can feed the, what they're, they're working hypotheses and conclusions, in, and then we'll come out with a report about a community dialogue. And then we can do uh, citywide public opinion polling. We can talk about action plans. We can educate people, but it's not just about educating people. It's about bringing people together into a conversation and having people feel that it's not just about the conversation, that that conversation will lead to something. And where that could lead is then a set of recommendations to our elected representatives about a series of topics that are, that are really important. And I think if Kansas City could do that under the guidance and, and leadership and inspiration of the center, like this would be a major story in newspapers around the world, and it could set an example for everybody. But it's expensive. And so for them to do this, we need your help. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm up for it. But you know, the only way that we've ever been able to do this is with volunteers Great. and leaders. Sign me up. All right. Sign me up. We'll do that. We'll do that. So to begin this conversation, we're inviting you back in August for the yeah. Joanne Berkeley Symposium. It'll be August 14th. And we're inviting all of you to that event as well. I want you to pick up a book and read it, talk about it at the dinner table, come back with your ideas, and we'll hold you to Good. this. Good. All right? And be able to, to begin the conversation. 
so that we can carry this on. And maybe in five years, we'll find we're on the same team. We're already on the same <laughs> team, Kevin. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Uh, let's see, we've got, I think, <coughs> I have a, another uh, three minutes, we gotta be out of here. Wow. We have a board member, uh, Eva Karp, our vice chair, who flew into St. Louis and got so frustrated waiting for the next plane, she got in a car to drive back here so she could do the final, is she here? Is wow. She is. <coughs> wow. All right, that's... all the way from St. Louis on the road. <laughs> Thank you so much. You can't plug me down. <laughs> Great evening. So I now know you're going to go home and read Jamie's book, and you're going to start your strategic plan for your genomic planning, right? And you're not going to sleep well tonight. <laughs> um, a few reminders before you leave tonight. In a few weeks, you're going to receive a survey from the center about this evening. Please help us continue to improve these uh, events and give us feedback. We really do look at that information and plan for the next event. Videos from tonight will be available on the event page of the center's website. And if you've made a donation tonight, you would like to take a purchase, or you would like to purchase one of the uh, arrangements on the table for $20, please uh, place your contribution in the envelopes that are on the table and hand them to a center volunteer on your way out. Don't forget to pick up Jamie's book on the way out and don't fight over it. You only get one copy per family member and those of you that don't sleep tonight because you're reading that book, it's Jamie's fault, not us. And then hand it over to your spouse or significant other so they also can read it. Again, thank you for supporting the center and enabling us to do this important work. We look forward to seeing you next year and have a great evening. Drive carefully. Bye.